How are you applying the law of Allah without hikmah? You're going to create injustice. And so he brings them together. Jesus brings them together. And then after this battle between kitab and hikmah, the final messenger comes, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says, I'm going to give this messenger al-kitab wal hikmah together. This new short series is based on the findings of Dr. Saqib Hussain in his PhD thesis, Wisdom in the Quran, which was summarized and presented by Ustad Norman in front of a live audience. The link to the full paper is in the description. All right, anybody know, does anybody here know what the golden rule is? Does anybody know what the golden rule is? Any idea? Nobody? Well, impressive. Yeah, what's the golden rule? Shaula? Huh? Yeah, treat others as you want to be treated yourself. Do unto others as you would want to be done to you. Right? So that's the golden rule. It's based on something that's in the Bible, but it's found in different cultures, philosophies. It's a very well-known wisdom, isn't it? It's a very well-known wisdom. It's also in the Qur'an. And I want you to see some examples of the golden rule in the Qur'an. وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَانُوا هُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوا هُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ Allah says, one of the places in hell is dedicated for people who cheat but just a little bit. They cheat just a little bit. When they are the customer, they make sure they get 100%. But when they are the ones selling, they give a little less than what they should. They give a little less than what they should. So they violate, essentially, they violate the golden rule. They want 100 for themselves, but they want to give 90 back. You understand? So Allah mentions these people and says, don't they think that they're going to be raised before Allah? That's one. The second is وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهِ Actually, no. The, the other one is there's people that have somebody dies and there's an inheritance, right? And when the inheritance is about to be announced that this person left the farm, they left the well, they left these camels, these animals, whatever they left, and they're about to make an announcement for what they left behind, then sometimes you find uh, poor kids or orphans or somebody else in the community, they find out that a really rich person died, so they show up at the announcement because they're hoping that maybe right now, because this person died, they might give some of their items as charity, right? And you get annoyed that these people, why are these poor people here? Or why are these children here? You know? Or even the children of people who died, who, because they can't represent themselves, they don't have a lawyer, then the uncles can take all the money. Right? Or the brothers can take all the money. But the kids are not going to get anything. Allah says, وَالْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَنْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Those who are, who are leaving behind, had they, though they should be afraid, those who left the people behind them, that if they themselves had children that they were afraid for, what would happen if they were the ones dying and their kids would be the one being deprived? This is Allah reminding them of the golden rule, isn't He? Similarly, there's a golden rule be between us and Allah. Ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Do your best with Allah the way Allah has done so beautifully with you. Ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. But my, the, the one that's tied to hikmah is actually really interesting in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, those of you who believe, أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ Spend out of the good, and good things that you have earned. Spend out of the good things that you've earned. Now you have a lot of stuff that you've earned, but the best of it is what Allah wants you to spend from. Then He says, وَمِمَّا أَخْرَجْنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ and also spend from the things we bring out for you from the land. The resources, the minerals, the crop, etc., etc. وَلَا تَيَمَّمُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ وَلَسْتُمْ بِآخِذِهِ إِلَّا أَن تُعْمِدُوا فِيهِ This is the golden rule now. He says, and don't replace good stuff with filthy things, meaning it's time to give uh, your clothes 
Donate clothes to the needy because they're victims from a flood. So you find the smelliest old hoodie you can or the, the thing that has more holes than your, you know, character. I don't know. And you find the oldest, smelliest clothes and you give those away. Right? Or it's time to give Eid gifts away, children gifts. All the broken toys, give those away. Right? All the old shoes, give them away. Allah says, don't give the kind of things if some, that someone gave them to you, you would squint your eyes and wouldn't even want to look at it. You would be so disgusted to accept it. And then later on in this same passage, Allah says, يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives wisdom to whoever he wants. Whoever has wisdom has been given a lot of good. Meaning one of the dimensions of wisdom in this passage is actually give to others what you one day might want to receive yourself. Have the mentality when you're giving sadaqa to someone that you're giving it almost to yourself. And with that mentality, give. And that's the wisdom that very few people have. Allah says He gives that to whoever He wants and whoever has it has been given an amazing good. Okay? Now, um, this is now our final section. And this is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time. I, I explained already to you the difference between law and wisdom in the last session, right? Law is black and white. And wisdom is kind of situation by situation. But now, we have to combine the two of them. We have to actually look at the two of them together. You might not know this, but the laws in the Qur'an, the one law in the Qur'an that is talked about in more detail than any other law, and I'm not talking about worship, I'm talking about a law that has people, people's dealings, mu'amalat. The most detailed law in the Qur'an is divorce. There's no law that Allah talks about in more detail in the entire Qur'an than He does about divorce. If somebody asks the question, what does the Qur'an say about a happy marriage? There's like two ayahs. And then if you ask, what's the Qur'an say about divorce? There are several pages and then a surah on top of that and then other references. Why? Why didn't Allah give relationship advice like TikTok does? Because there's so much relationship hikmah all over. The, all the Abu Jahls of the world give all this relationship advice. And the Qur'an is silent on relationship advice. Except very little. This is the ayah of Surah Al-Rum, is the ayah every, um, um, some, some little bit of hints in the ayat of Ramadan. It's bits and pieces here and there. But the majority, when you talk about divorce, oh my God. You know why? It's as if, it's as if, and I, I, here's the principle, Allah teaches you what you couldn't possibly learn yourself or know yourself. Which means Allah knows that you know how to have a good relationship. You don't need some outside help to figure out how to have a good marriage. But what you don't know how to do is to have a peaceful divorce. That you don't know. You know how to keep things good but you don't know how to handle the situation when things go bad, that you couldn't figure out yourself, there I will give you exhaustive explanation. And so Allah gives exhaustive explanation about what should happen when somebody's getting divorced. How that and the thing is, these are, you can call them the laws of divorce. So this part of the Quran is kitab, isn't it? It's kitab. We're going to look at a little bit of that. I mean, we can't go through all of that because it's huge. It's a very big subject. But I'm going to show you just a, one small sampling of it. This is not a full-on tafsir. It's a very brief commentary, okay? When a man and a woman are married, then a man can pronounce his divorce and still be able to take her back twice. That can happen at two occasions, two separate occasions. Nowadays, people have made a joke out of this and said, talak, 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 talak. what you going to do now? And then two hours later, I didn't mean it. It didn't count. Let's go find a mufti. Right? Because we made a joke out of the... By the way, is, isn't that making the ayat of Allah a joke? It is, right? And you know what's even crazier? This is, I don't know if this is just Pakistanis or what, but a lot of people have told me, oh, it doesn't count unless you say it three times. Who told you? That? What book are you reading? Did you, are you learning Islam from a comic book? This is psychosis. 
Allah says revocable, reversible divorce can happen on two occasions. You can end the marriage that it's still reversible on two occasions. Then he says, listen carefully, فَإِمْسَاكٌ بِمَعْرُوفٍ Then after that happens, any one of those, he says, I divorce you. And then he thinks about it, they think about it, they talk about it. And he says, you know what, let's try again. He says, then take back, hold on to the marriage, but hold on to it with decency. Hold on to it with dignity, with decent, with goodness. Now, holding on to it with goodness, let me ask you, does that sound like law or wisdom? Immediately after the law, Allah switched over to what? Wisdom. Because I cannot check if I'm taking back for good intention in a good way or not. That's not something the law can judge. Not, di not directly. Or let go beautifully. He says let go what? Beautifully. Quran is saying that. Quran is saying that. You know when divorce happens, it gets really ugly, right? And now Allah is telling you, Listen, you don't know how to handle this situation. I'm telling you, do everything you can to let go in a way that is beautiful. And what happens a lot of times is one person fears Allah and says, I want to let go in a way that's beautiful. The other one says, <laughs> let me see how I'll show you beautiful. Right? Then he says, it is not knowledge talking to the men. He says, it's not halal for you. You're not allowed to take anything back that you gave to them. If you gave her a car, if you gave her a ring, if you gave her a necklace, if you bought her a PS5, right? Because you bought yourself a PS5 for Eid, but you said, this is your Eid present. So officially you made it her Eid present. I'm just playing it so it doesn't go kharab, you know? I'm just keeping it... <laughs> If you gave it to her, Allah says, it's not halal for you to take back anything that you had given to them. Okay? Then, إِلَّا أَنْ يَخَافَ أَنْ لَا يُقِيمَ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ Unless they're both scared that they're not going to be able to abide by the laws of Allah. This is going to be a longer discussion, so I won't go into details here. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا يُقِيمَ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ And if you're afraid that they both cannot abide by the law of Allah, فَلَا جُلَاهَ عَلَيْهِمَا فِي مَفْدَدَتْ بِهِ Then there's no harm on either of them if she gives up some part of what she owed. Basically, the bottom line here, I'm being very brief here for now, is she wants to end the marriage, for example, but he doesn't want to let go. And she says, you know what? Keep the PS5. Can you just let me go? I just, I don't want to stay. Just keep the PS5. Allah says there's no harm if she gives up something that's actually hers, but she says maybe that'll make the departure easy for me. Okay? So she's kind of almost like paying a ransom in this situation a little bit. So he says, that, okay, he's not making her do it, but he's saying if that's what gets you away from the situation, it's no harm if you try to do that. That's halal for you. Because he already said it's not halal to take anything, right? But now he says, by the way, but if you think giving something up will let him go easy, then just do that. Okay? Those are the limits set by Allah. Don't cross them. And whoever crosses the limits set by Allah, then those are the people that have done wrong. Now, But if a third time he divorced her again, so two have already been mentioned. This is which time? Third time. She is no longer permissible for him. They can't be together immediately. That, that's not possible. Thereafter. Until she gets married to someone other than him. So she, she can't be with him anymore. Zubair is done. Sorry, Zubair is just an example. Zubair is done. She moved on with her life. Five months later, she got married to Kareem. Sorry, Kareem. Okay. And then she married Kareem and Kareem turned out that he uh, likes Xbox. He doesn't like the PS5. Something happened. They, 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 they didn't work out. And now she got divorced again. Okay. Now she got divorced and she sent a text message to uh, Zubair and said, hey, uh, what you doing? And Zubair says, well, why are you taking, aren't you married? No, not anymore. <laughs> and so Zubair says, okay, let's try this again. 
then it's okay. It's okay for you to go back to him if you got married to someone else and then it didn't work out for a lady that's being told. Otherwise, otherwise the man is not allowed. By the way, what could be the wisdom? What's the hikmah behind that? Well, if a man says to a woman, I don't want you, I divorce you. Okay, okay, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. And she comes back two months later. You think I want you? I don't want you. Get out of here. Kicks her out again. Then takes her back. The third time, you don't get to yo-yo with this woman. The third time, it's done. Now you must experience the pain of knowing that she was with someone else. Because you didn't value her. So if you really want her back, Allah is going to have her live her life. And if that doesn't work out, and she still wants you, decides that she wants you back, then maybe you can get back together. Otherwise, you guys are done. So this is, this is teaching, Allah teaching that don't take divorce as something that you can just play with. Right? Because it, the, it is a sacred relationship. Anyway, so, then there's no harm if they want, both want to get back together. In dhanna and yuqima hududullah, if they both believe that they'll be able to live by the limits set by Allah. وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the limits set by Allah. يُبَيِّنُهَا لِقَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ He's clarifying them for people who really want to know. وَإِذَا طَلَّقْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ And when you divorce women, finally, when you divorce women, meaning the first divorce, one of the, one of the ones you can take back. فَبَلَغْنَا أَجَلَهُنَّا And they've reached their deadline because you have to have three periods. Before three periods, you can still take her back. So they're about to reach their third period. Okay, and he knows it's coming. It's in a couple of days or it's in 24 hours, whatever. If they're about to reach their deadline, either you take them back, but take them back in a dignified way. Or let them go in a dignified way. Then he says, Don't take them back with the intention of causing harm. Don't take them back to cause harm so you can cross lines. In other words, you hate her and you hate the idea that she's going to be free. You don't love her. You just hate the idea of losing control over her. So you kept her in the state of divorce. She doesn't know if you'll take her back or not. She's hoping it works out, but she doesn't know what's going on in your head. In your head, you just want her to suffer. So. You wait until almost the three months and then you say, no, 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 I want you back. And then when you take her back, you make her life hell until she can't take it anymore and you're done playing torture games with her. Then you say, you know what? Talaq to you. And then she feels like she's free, but she's almost free. She has to wait how long? Three months. 2.9 months are done. Almost there. And he says what? No, no, I'm not done with you yet. He takes her back again. Why is he doing it? He's doing it to torture her. He's doing it to torture her. Another meaning of this ayah could also be a man who takes the woman back, but he doesn't intend to make things right. Maybe he was violent or abusive or wasn't paying the finances, whatever he was doing. The dirar is still there. So even though he takes her back, he didn't fix any of the problems. Right? Don't take them back if you're going to keep doing the wrong thing. So you can keep crossing the line. This is what Allah says. Now listen to this. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهُ And whoever does that has done wrong to themselves. وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ هُزُوَا Don't make a joke out of the ayat of Allah. Don't make a joke out of the ayat of Allah. You know why this is important in the same ayah? It's important because Allah is saying these, ayat, these rules that God gave, these rules, they are the kitab. And then when he said, don't take them back for bad intentions, that wasn't kitab. What was that? That was hikmah. Technically, is he allowed to take her back within the time period? Yes. And is there a way to check if he did it for good intentions or bad intentions? Can a mufti check that? Can a judge check that? No. He knows his intentions. Nobody else knows. So basically, you can use the kitab of Allah. You can, you, you can be within the rules and still do evil because you are violating hikmah. You're violating justice. Hikmah is justice also. So you're, the lawyers here know you can win the case 
in the court of law. So you legally won, but it was not a moral thing that happened. You won legally, but never you didn't win morally. You understand? So he's taking her back legally halal. Morally right or wrong. So now we we know that kitab is the law and hikmah is morality. Law and what? Morality. And the Quran has fused the two of them together. You cannot separate them. What happened in our ummah? We became obsessed with law and other people said, to hell with the law, I don't care about the law. All I care about is what? Morality. I just want to be a good person. I'm a moral person. We separated kitab and hikmah. The kitab and the hikmah were together. The kitab is Quran and the hikmah is also Quran in early interpretations of the word hikmah. Now, Allah says, وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ هُزُوَا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ Remember the favor of Allah on you. وَمَا أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ يَعِذُكُمْ بِهِ And whatever He has sent to you, onto you, from the law and the wisdom, is there to give you advice. I am giving you in these ayat law, but I am also giving you, what is He saying? Wisdom. It's together. It's together. This is a huge message in our religion. Kitab and hikmah cannot be separated. Law and morality cannot be separated. Look at an example case study. You have, for example, a man who hates his wife. Doesn't divorce her though. Never divorced her. And there are plenty of people in South Asia that, married, that, that are married for like almost a century. And so their kids have grown up, their grandkids, their grandparents now, and even their sons and daughters look at them and say, why are you guys together? You guys hate each other so much. You're fighting all the time. What is it? It's like professional boxers. They enjoy the pain. <laughs> anyway, so what happens? The man is about to die. He's about to die. His wife is there. He doesn't like his wife. Two minutes before he dies, he goes, by the way, <laughs> I divorce you. Two minutes before he dies, he divorces her. If he divorces her, she doesn't have a share in the inheritance. You see that? Now, if he divorces her a couple of minutes before he dies, is that legally a divorce? It is. Legally, technically, you can divorce. You pronounce, and the divorce is finalized the moment he dies. But is that a violation of hikmah? Totally. Which is why the early fuqaha said, we're not going to let you do that. Because even though it looks like it's within kitab, it is against hikmah. You understand? Here's another case. A person wrote a will. They wrote a will. Okay, and in their will, they said, this percent of my income shall go to charity, this percent, this... There's the inheritance that's decided percentage, but there's a will also. Some portion of your money you can dedicate to a masjid, the charity, an orphanage, whatever, right? And the person died. And the person reading their will looks at it and sees, oh, okay. They wrote in their will because they hated their mom a lot or they hated their dad a lot. So they make sure that they gave a huge chunk of their will to one of their dad's enemies or something, something stupid like that, just as a grudge. Last. Last act as a grudge. So you see in the will that there is a bias and there is some kind of evil intention. Right? Allah says, if you see that, if you see ithman aw janafan, then there is no harm that you fix it. Allah allowed for a legal document for a person who's dead now. He's gone. Allah allowed for a legal document that looks like it's biased. It's against the principles of justice and wisdom for that document to be edited. Wallahu ghafurur rahim. Allah is forgiving. Isn't that incredible? We have been given, the, the Jewish tradition of thousands of years focused on the law and forgot all about what? Wisdom. Then Jesus comes and says, no, you guys have forgotten about hikmah. How are you applying the law of Allah without hikmah? You're going to create injustice. 
And so he brings them together. Jesus brings them together. And then after this battle between Kitab and Hikmah, the final messenger comes, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says, I'm going to give this messenger Al-Kitab wal Hikmah together. And that is the Quran. That is the Quran. And this is a miracle of Allah. It's a massive gift of Allah that he has given us this. The, the fusion between Kitab and Hikmah. Now, I'll give you a few examples of uh, Hikmah outside of that. Hikmah is also, here's the rule. You know, like sometimes your mom tells you to do something and you say, why? And she says, say that again. Say it again. Okay, 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 okay. Because sometimes you say, you, you, oh, you're, we're, we're having spaghetti. Why are we having spaghetti? Because we're having spaghetti. But why? Because you want to continue to live. In other words, I said it, that's enough. Because in that case, you respect the authority of the mom, and she says, I don't have to explain myself to you. The, the rules are the rules. The rules are the rules, right? I don't have to explain them to you. Allah gives us rules, yes or no? If there's anyone who doesn't have to explain why, it's Allah. If Allah says do something, and the human being says, but why? why? Why Why? do I have to pray five times? Why is it three rakah for Maghrib and four for Isha? Why can't I have two for Maghrib and one for Isha? Why is there no discount program? How come? Well, why not? And does Allah owe you an explanation for why? No, but look at what Allah does in the Quran. Allah says, alcohol and gambling are bad for you. And then he says, Ithmuhuma akbaru min naf'ihima, the harm that comes out of them is greater than any benefit that comes from them. The evil that comes from them is greater. Actually, literally says the evil that comes from them and the consequences that come from them are far greater than any good that comes from them. Allah didn't have to tell me that. Allah could have just said, stay away from gambling, stay away from alcohol. And if I said, but why? Because I told you why, that should be enough for you. You understand? But Allah didn't do that. In some cases, Allah said, let me tell you why. I'll tell you because I'm letting you know, if you keep consuming alcohol and you keep engaging in gambling, you will have a lot of harm. In the state of uh, uh, Nevada, uh, in the United States, uh, the state that has the city of Las Vegas, you may have heard of Las Vegas before, right? I've been to Las Vegas many times for a Quran conference. Um, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Some people were like, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> the state of Nevada for a long time, I don't know what the, I haven't gone back recently, but they made so much money from the casinos that they actually provide, if you get a B average in your high school, your four-year college degree is free in, in the state of Nevada. In America, you pay for college, but you don't pay in the state of Nevada if you have above a certain average. They don't have any state income tax. They have much better health care than most of the United States. They have more uh, uh, heart surgery uh, centers and hospitals than anywhere else, which makes sense. I think, <laughs> right? More heart attacks than anywhere else, right? Um, it's a really interesting place. And they have, they have better, they have laws where you can't harass citizens. You know, in, in America, the police, they hide behind the bridge so when you speed, they pull out. But they're not allowed to hide in the state of Nevada. They're not allowed to hide. So they have all these provisions. So, so much benefit came to that society because of the gambling industry. You understand? And of course, the casinos, how do they keep their customers in the casinos? They actually have, you know how we have air conditioning here? They have oxygen pumps in the, in the, 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 the slot machine room. They keep pumping fresh oxygen into the room so you stay awake longer. They actually literally do that. Okay? And the, the engineers, 
the behavior psychologists that developed the slot machines and the psychology of gambling to keep people addicted and keep them going. Some of the top ones were hired by Facebook and Instagram and other leading social media uh, companies to create addictive behavior for social media companies. So you should look that up. It's pretty fun facts. Okay. But anyway, they create this environment and of course they serve alcohol in some of these casinos they serve you. So long as you stay at the tables and you keep gambling, they provide you free alcohol. Okay. So now you're getting free drinks. You're getting all this stuff. How do I know this? I, 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 reached, I Googled. Okay. And I Googled. But all of this, this environment that they create and so many economic benefits came to them from this. But nobody talks about it. the suicide rate, the murder rate, how many families go bankrupt because of somebody's alcohol addiction. They use up their family savings. They lose their job. They gamble away the house. They gamble away the retirement account. They gamble away the car. They gamble away the, life, the college savings for their kids. Families are destroyed. Future generations are destroyed. You get some tax benefits. You get some fancier houses in Las Vegas. You get some pretty streets. What do you pay in return? The human cost is much greater than any benefit that comes out of them. I asked a doctor in the United States, I asked a doctor who works in the emergency room and he works on Friday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. And I asked him, what's the worst night in the emergency room? He said, Friday night. And he's, I asked him, what, what have you seen? He says, I see why Allah says there's evil in alcohol. What people do after they get drunk, I see every Friday night. It's not just people you know, running their car into a tree or killing a child. It's people abusing each other, murdering, beating, and then not remembering what they did. They don't remember what they did. You know? So Allah, what did he do? He could have said, don't drink alcohol. But he said what? The harm is greater than any benefit. He tried to explain it to us. When it came to divorce, people are getting divorced. Everybody has advice. Don't do it. It will ruin your life. What are you going to do after that? Your life is over. You know how much shame will come on your family? Where are you going to provide from? How are you going to take care of yourself? You're, this is the most unwise decision ever, ever. And what does Allah say? Allah also has advice. Allah, Allah talked more about divorce than He talked about anything else. What did Allah say? Allah said, And if they end up parting ways, if they both go two different ways, Allah will give each of them from his own vastness. Allah will take care of them. Allah gave hope. Everybody else is criticizing them and blaming them and pointing fingers at them. And Allah is saying what? I'll take care of you. You'll be okay. I know this is depressing. I know you didn't get married to get divorced. I, did, I know you didn't think it would turn out this way. I know that you didn't intend it this way. Life happened. Situations happened. Don't be beat up. Allah will open new doors for you. Did you know the famous ayah? Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah makes a way out for them and will provide them from where they couldn't even imagine. That's in the surah of divorce. That's wisdom Allah taught to people that are getting divorced because they feel like every door will be closed for them. Life is over for them. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? She's everything to me. He's everything to me. Now what? Allah says, here's some wisdom for you. You need some wisdom right now. One of the early definitions of wisdom was also advice. Advice. What will Allah do? Allah will sometimes give us a rule. And with that rule, He will also give us what? Advice. Here's some advice for you. Here's some encouragement for you. That's also wisdom. On this, uh, this you know, on fasting, for example. And by the way, just since we're on the subject of divorce, let's finish that up. Allah says, even if you are going to get divorced, He says, لا تنسون فضل بينكم Don't forget to do favors to each other as you're getting divorced. Instead of, you know, I'm so glad I don't have to see their face anymore and every time I hear their name, I go, Tuh. Instead of that, Allah says, don't forget to do favors for each other. Just do the favor. Let it go. لا تنسون فضل بينكم he, said, he then says about fasting. Fasting is a rule. Fast. Allah could have said just fast in the month of Ramadan or fast when I'm telling you to fast. He doesn't. He says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you can develop. Why should I fast, Ya Allah? So you develop an awareness of me. 
It'll help you develop God awareness. It'll wake something in you spiritually. It'll help you spiritually. This is Allah providing us the hikmah of fasting. What am I trying to tell you? More and more and more in the Quran, you will find laws, but right next to the law, right next to the kitab, there will be the what? The hikmah. And you have to look at them together. You have to look at the moral code and the legal code together. Because if you only look at the, the kitab, then you will become like Bani Israel. And if you only look at the hikmah, you will become like the Christians. That will, that's, those are the extremes that you will go to. But you must bring the both of them together. Right? This is what you alimuhum al kitaba wal hikmah. Subhanallah. So these are the few things that I wanted to uh, share with you in this uh, short journey. I hope you guys benefited from it, inshallah. I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Quran all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Quran. We are students of the Quran ourselves and we want you to be students of the Quran alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Quran a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Quran beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.